inside an inflatable space station, daily life. The ultimate in luxury available from space travel. Or death by sure in a flimsy balloon. Debates on this divisive topic date back to before the space race even started. The history of inflatable space stations is turbulent and lengthy. However, when you consider the future, as commerce and travel reach lower orbits around the Earth, once again, inflatables are setting the standard. Now, let's discuss living inside a space balloon. The first inflatable space station ever produced in a formal manner. Release date dates back to 1961. The Erectable Taurus Man Space Laboratory was the name of the station. Additionally, Goodyear Aircraft Corporation manufactured it. The same business that created the famous Los Angeles blimps. However, the idea of inflatable space stations has existed for far longer. Their first ideas were published prior to NASA's establishment in the 1950s. Braun, Werner an American aerospace engineer and space architect who was a Nazi scientist. The wheel station was released. Its idea and design are mostly derived by the Goodyear space station. Thus, it's clear where they found inspiration. The wheel's concept designs had a diameter of up to 75 meters and accommodated a crew of 80 or more. The outer toroid or ring of the station was made out of one smooth, inflated donut-shaped piece composed of rubber reinforcement. Additionally, the station's center axis could be rotated to replicate artificial gravity inside the ship. However, before the station ever left Earth, its construction was abandoned. Despite building the station's facade using sturdy materials, it wouldn't be able to divert space dust and micrometeoroids effectively. Additionally, the aboard crew's demise may have been guaranteed by a puncher in the station. Furthermore, the cost was really high. NASA also determined that concentrating on the Apollo program would be more worthwhile. The one who ultimately succeeded in sending the first people to the moon. So don't worry, it didn't go up. What was lost outside an inflatable space station was gained in spades. Suggested in 1989 by the Man Systems Branch at Johnson Space Center. That was never exposed to daylight until the late 1990s, that is. Up until space agencies started to show interest in inflatable space stations. The term transit habitat was contracted to become transshap, honoring the original design, be used as a means of interplanetary transportation to get people to Mars. NASA intended to deploy the inflatable to take the place of the International Space Station's current habitation module. The Transshab's diameter would have been 27 feet at full expansion. Measuring just 14 feet wide, an improvement above the ISS crew housing module. Would have, I say. Due to the Transshab's unfinished nature. The project was contentious due to the ISS program's rising expenses and the delays it experienced during construction. The National Space Society's 1999 policy statement also did nothing to encourage its growth. The group suggested that NASA scrap the Transshap project while carrying out further research and development on inflatable space stations. The project was then formally abandoned in 2000 when House Resolution 1654 was passed. The Clinton administration was in charge of the White House at the time, and they opposed the law, but it passed. Although this measure included wording that permitted NASA to hire private businesses to construct the Transshap themselves, it essentially prohibited the government from continuing with its development of the project. Bigelow Aerospace, a business, saw an opportunity and purchased the patent rights for the Transshap. Bigelow developed and launched three inflatable satellites of their own using those concepts. Where in the cosmos may humans travel to write the next chapter in the history of our race, one that takes place beyond Earth? Though we've all considered terraforming Mars to make it livable in the future, are there any other planets in the cosmos that already possess the particular elements required to support life as we know it? Exist more planets than Earth? Is an excellent documentary that attempts to respond to the question. The movie, as its title implies, investigates the findings of advanced space technology in locating planets similar to Earth across the cosmos. The video's sponsor, Magellan TV, 
offers a number of exclusives, including the documentary. There are now 72 space documentaries available for viewing during the 30-day free trial period of their site. In addition, they have a ton of more documentaries available in 14 other categories, such as science and technology, military and warfare, and ancient history. Completely free of advertisements, Magellan TV offers a growing library of fresh 4K video that is uploaded every week. From my own experience, there has been a remarkable consistency in both the video and material quality. Even without the 30-day free trial, I can't say enough good things about this service. As little as 5 per month may be used to subscribe to Magellan TV right now. When compared to other streaming services, their costs are much more reasonable. It's a wonderful deal for having such a large collection of 4K quality documentaries. To watch a free 30-day trial, click the link in the description box. Are there additional planets in addition to the whole of Marvelant's vast library of more than 3,000 documentaries? Bigelow Aerospace used its Genesis 1 to construct a scaled-down version of the Transshap. The module is 14.4 feet long. In around 10 seconds, its circumference increased from 5 feet 3 inches to 8 feet 4 inches. More than a dozen cameras and onboard diagnostic devices were powered by the solar-powered module. Using solar-powered panels. Bigelow Aerospace deployed the Genesis 1's first operational prototype in 2006. It was only supposed to last six months, yet it spent 2.5 years sending data back to Earth. Genesis 1 is now in a stable orbit with a 64.5 degree inclination, circling approximately 470 kilometers. The content of Genesis 2 remained mostly unchanged from Genesis 1, with the exception of a few additional additions. More cameras were included, along with an enhanced sensor suite, an enhanced gas inflation system, and reaction wheels that helped the module to better orient itself in space. Like its predecessor, Genesis 2 was put into service in 2007 and ran for around 2.5 years. It would take until 2016 for Bigelow Aerospace to launch another module. They launched the 17.8 million Bigelow Extendable Activity Module during this year. More often referred to as BEAM. In order to explore, test, and evaluate the usage of inflatable space modules, this module was created specifically for the International Space Station as part of an experimental initiative. In addition to demonstrating safe deployment and operating accessibility throughout a flying mission, BEAMS aims to ascertain the radiation shielding capabilities of inflatable modules and showcase other qualities such as their mechanical durability, long-term leak performance, and other technological skills. BEAM had the ability to expand in both diameter and length, unlike the Genesis modules. It took 7 hours for its 7.1-foot length and 7.9-foot circumference to expand. It was 13. 2 feet long and 10.6 feet in diameter when it was fully expanded inside the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. After an engineering evaluation in 2019, NASA confirmed BEAM to remain linked to the International Space Station until 2028. The module was transported to the ISS in April 2016. Many more inflatable space modules were planned by Bigelow Aerospace, but they were never completed since the firm fired all of its employees in March 2020 and ceased operations in 2021. The CEO of the firm has gone on to other commercial endeavors, and the company is now regarded as defunct. The Bigelow Commercial Space Station was the most prominent, if not the most renowned, of these concepts. From Bigelow Aerospace's establishment in 1998 until its demise in 2021, this concept persisted. The Bigelow Commercial Space Station was really a number of distinct projects that worked toward that objective during the period of the company's existence, which is why I refer to it as a concept rather than a single project. The business initially unveiled its concepts for a type of space hotel in 2004, but at that time, they lacked a formal project name. They explained how this hotel will link many space modules to create a manned space facility in low Earth orbit for space tourism and research supported by both governmental and commercial funding sources. With every version of a space hotel, this concept persisted. The inflatable modules they employed were approximately long and 22 feet in diameter. 
In actuality, they served as the foundation of Bigelow's commercial space stations. Now, given that the company's founder, Robert Bigelow, amassed his wealth via a network of low-cost vacation hotels, this tactic should come as no surprise. Bigelow started the Aerospace Corporation while he was already in his late 50s. It's really very fascinating that he brought in that old-school business model from the days before SpaceX and Blue Origin. Look into this. A contemporary space corporation might only create a few glossy computer-generated images CGI depicting their design idea however, Bigelow actually produced full-scale production prototypes of his space hotels, complete with fully functional interiors and furniture. Subsequently, he extended an invitation to many reporters to visit the establishment and investigate the inflated modules. This gives us a realistic idea of what life might be like inside one of these monsters. They feature many rooms, passageways and corridors, bathrooms, showers, common areas, and very thin, curved monitors set into the walls. A world of imagined 3D renderings completely loses the sense of size and human perspective that comes from seeing actual people within real buildings. Although a few of these B-330 models were constructed and tested on land, none of them have ever been sent into space. A 2021 launch strategy was in place, however it was abandoned when the business shut down. Bigelow Aerospace unveiled their first official idea for a space hotel in 2005, the same year. The commercial space station Skywalker was given that name. Despite being shortened to CSS Skywalker, the spacecraft was intended to be made up of many parts and have a multidirectional propulsion module that would enable it to travel on interplanetary or lunar paths. Five to seven crew members would have been accommodated aboard the CSS Skywalker, with estimated nightly rates of one million. The designs for the second Bigelow Space Hotel were made public in 2010. The Bigelow Next Generation Commercial Space Station was the official name given to it. Two Sundancer modules and a single B-330 module were initially intended to make up Space Complex Alpha, even though that was its more popular name. However, Bigelow began claiming it had two B-330s rather than two Sundancers by the time it reached its final version. 2020 was supposed to be the launch date for Space Complex Alpha, but that plan was derailed when the business let go of every employee. After Bigelow Aerospace's 20-year dominance over inflatable space modules, who is the new holder of the title? The creation of Sierra Space's big, open, interconnected settings commonly known as LIFE is an excellent place to start. The largest of their five LIFE modules, LIFE 3.0, has been produced. The length of this module is 72 feet and 2 inches, while its diameter is 62 feet and 4 inches. Sierra Space guarantees a secure and pleasant living environment, protected by many layers of state-of-the-art Vectron fabric. The habitat will include three floors with areas for living and working. On prolonged stay missions like Bigelow Aerospace's B-330s, fresh food may be grown for sustainable sustenance in Sierra's own space greenhouse, Astro Garden, which will be incorporated with the LIFE module. More ambitious space stations will be built around LIFE modules. Currently, the orbital reef is the primary one that is envisioned. The parent firm of Sierra Spaces, Sierra Nevada Corporation, is working with Blue Origin to create the Orbital Reef Space Station. With NASA money. For this project, Blue Origin received a 130 million prize. Blue Origin describes the station as a mixed-use corporate park, with plans to utilize it for commercial space operations and space tourism. By 2027, if everything goes according to plan, the station should be completely operational. But let's say much higher than that. What if, for example, inflatable spacecraft were used to inhabit the moon? That's precisely what Nimacell hopes to do with Nimoplanet, a sophisticated moon-based idea. The 32 astronauts would have living quarters and 16 greenhouses in the inflatable habitat built by the Austrian firm to maintain the sunshine supply for the plants housed in the greenhouses. The idea is to have revolving mirrors that direct sunshine toward them all the time. For six hours out of every 24-hour period, these mirrors would direct the sun away from the base, simulating darkness for the crew members. 
In order to maximize its self-sufficiency, the business said that Nemo Planet will recycle its own food and oxygen in addition to using solar electricity. If you believe that this is all unfeasible, reconsider. The Open Space Innovation Platform Initiative OSIP of the European Space Agency is said to have provided money to Numo Planet. As time goes on, the initiative hopes to better meet evolving demands in space. And it is the true tale of the development of inflatable space stations. We cannot dispute the logistical benefits that inflatables provide if we are willing to acknowledge that we do not have limitless funds or time to complete these projects and proceed. Although they may be risky, they are unquestionably cool, and that is ultimately the goal of human space travel.